Yeah, uh, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to my talk, How to Rangeify Your Code. If you're already seen this talk at some uh, conference, um, this won't be, um, won't be new to you. Um, it's a little bit shorter than the versions from the conferences, but that gives you more opportunities to ask questions so that uh, I can answer them. And um, also a little bit self-promotion. Um, I hope that's all right. Um, if you want to give a talk, but you don't know exactly how to approach it, um, in one of the meeting C++ meetups, um, there was a um, special on how to give talks. And I also gave a talk and the title was, but I don't have anything to talk about. So um, if you searching for a topic, you want to do something, but you don't really know what you want to talk about, then you can check out my talk from the series and you can also check out the other talks from the series. I think they are all um, really, really good information on how to actually give a talk and how to find a topic and how to approach um, giving a talk. So <laughs> that was a little bit self-promotion and now uh, let's start with this talk. So, um, okay. So um, in my company, we use the new C++ standards right away, which is amazing. I really like that. But if you do that in the beginning, when you look up how to use those features, um, there's not a lot of information out there. Um, most of the material is very technical and it's all focused on the, the standard and how the standard is written and um, stuff like that. But no one really shows you how to actually use the features. And so I thought, um, well, we have lots of loops in, and algorithms in the code. So can we rangeify them? And if so, how can we do that? And this is how this talk came to be. So um, the examples that I will show you um, are from our code base, but they are changed um, and they are simplified. So if something you know looks extremely simple to you that's because i needed to simplify the code and so that it fits on the slide but um, the method for um for changing the code into ranges and using ranges uh, is the same and before i start with all the examples i have some talk recommendations if you're new to ranges um First, all the talks from Eric Niebler. Um, he's the author of the Range V3 library, which is the biggest ranges library there is. And also the standard ranges are based on the Range V3 library. And he goes very in depth on um, what ranges are, um, how you use his library and all the concepts behind them. Um, the next talk I'm going to recommend is from Tristan Brindle, an overview of standard ranges. And this is your place to start if you want to know what made it into the C++ 20 um, standard um, regarding ranges. Also, a really great talk from Kristen Brindle is um, C++ 20 ranges in practice. Um, it's also, uh, like my talk, very practice oriented with a lot of example, but also more background information like mine is more focused on the actual examples and Tristan also gives you a little bit more of the background information. And then there is this two piece talk, uh, let's say um, it's called what a view um, building your own lazy range adapters from Christopher Di Bella. And in this talk, you learn how you can write your own range adapters or views. <clears throat> Um, this is what we, <clears throat> sorry, this is what we um, use when, or when, what we think about when we talk about ranges. This is the thing behind the pipe operator. And you can write those your own. And um, this two-piece talk um, shows you how to do that. And also, if you want to learn how to write um, these kind of range adapters, you can check out Cybrand's uh, YouTube channel. They have lots of live coding sessions on there, uh, how to implement um, certain ranges features that are not yet in the standard library, but they are very, very um, useful like ranges too. And we're going to see that uh, a lot in my examples as well. And stuff like enumerate or stride, which you might know from other languages like Python, um, they work the same than in C++ when you 
uh, have these range adapters. If you are not on C++ 20 yet, <clears throat> or the standard library lacks um, some features for you, you can also check out um, ranges libraries. And the first and the biggest library I'm recommending is the range v3 library. This is the most extensive library for ranges support. And it's also the basis of the range support in the standard library. <clears throat> if you want to know more about this library, again, I highly recommend Eric Niebuhr's talks. Then we have Nano Range, which is, I think, the second largest ranges library. Um, it's very close to the standard and it provides concepts, range based algorithms, function objects, and projections. Um, then again, I showed you uh, Zybrand's uh, YouTube channel. They also have a GitHub um, where they upload all the ranges adapters they implemented. And you can check that out on GitHub and use them. Also, there's the ranges next library. Um, it's, it's a small library. They provide ranges to enumerate and Cartesian product. Um, but these are very helpful ranges. So if you only want to use them, um, then feel free to check out ranges next. <clears throat> and then last but not least, we have boost range. And boost range is an entire library that is already range based or that, uh, that has range based algorithms. And they also have a few range adapters like using the, the pipe operator. Um, for example, Strided. So <clears throat> now, what do I mean when I talk about rangifying the code? Um, I think most of the people, um, when they hear about ranges in C++, they think about the, the pipe operator. And um, we will focus a lot on the pipe operator as well, but it's ranges are more than just the pipe operator. It's also range-based algorithms. And these algorithms um, give you the option to better describe intent. So um, ranges are also new to the library. So we have the tendency to think in loops first because that's what we learned first. And we're doing them the longest, so it's the most natural to us. And a change in that already happened on the introduction of algorithms. It even got and still gets backlash from people saying that they are harder to read and they don't trust the algorithm because they don't know what's behind them and how they're implemented and they want to see the loop and you know stuff like that. And the same prejudice also holds against ranges. The syntax is the most unfamiliar, especially compared to loops. And it, this is more of a functional programming approach where you describe what the code does and not how it does it. So um, people are saying that it's hard to read and hard to use. But I think that once you get used to it, and once you get used to reading the syntax, um, then actually reading and writing the code gets easier and easier. And also the key, again, to, to everything is to learn your algorithms. You need to know what is available. Um, the range v3 library, for example, is like is really, really extensive. Then you need to know what um, algorithms are available to you and what they actually do. And if you know that, then you can uh, write this um, easily and you can read it also easily. So as I said, rangeify also means <clears throat> using range based algorithm. You might think there's not a huge change. We can just omit the begin and end um, for the algorithms, but it gives you the option to better describe intent rather than implementation details. And it limits noise. Um, also, we now have views that we can use in the algorithms. So let's say we have a vector of doubles here, and you want to modify it and store the, the result in a new vector. There are, I think, <clears throat> probably a thousand ways of doing this in C++. Um, you have your index-based loop, your uh, iterator-based loop, your range-based loop. You also have your standard library transform. This is the C++ 17 version where you call begin and end um, on the input range. 
And uh, then you have the C20 version where you can call ranges transform. And now you can uh, uh, you can omit the begin and end from the input vector and just call transform on the entire vector. Um, this is totally fine, this works, but you could do another thing if you wanted to, like if you wanted to make it really clear to the reader that a copy is happening here, you could use ranges copy and then the pipe operator and then a transform view on the input vector. Calling All of these are calling the same modify function, which is the lambda that is, um, uh, that is written above. And what and this does the exact same thing than transform, but you make it maybe a little bit more clear that a copy is happening here. Um, but I wouldn't do any of these. I would actually want to write this. So um, I would want to use the transform view with a modify function and then use ranges two to create a new vector. And this is, has the um, advantage that you can make your output vector const. Ranges2, sadly, is not part of the C20 standard, but you can use it um, via range v3. So the uh, last line is written with the range v3 library, and everything above is written with the standard library. Um, and now, before we move on, um, the inevitable, inevitable um, disclaimer, I'm not saying that like one solution is better than the other solution. Um, it's up to the programmer to decide um, what might be the most readable option uh, or solution. And um, I'm not saying that ranges are the best in uh, the best fit for everything. Um, I'm not even saying that here in this example, um, the copy would be better than the transform. So this is, this is up to you how you want to describe what your code does to the reader. If it's extremely important to you that someone knows that there's a copy happening, then you can use the copy. Um, if, you, if you think it's clear um, that it's happening, then you can use the transform um, or like, uh, um, for each which would do as well. Um, so again, I'm not saying like all of these examples that I'm showing that one way is better than the other. It's just another way of doing these, um, yeah, of, of programming, of using the, the language features. So um, now I'm going to um, start with the examples. Most of them fit on one slide or both um, solutions fit on one slide. And after each example, I will give you the time to ask questions, or you can ask questions right now, type them in the chat. And after each example, um, I'm going to answer um, your questions. And in the end, again, there's also time for, for questions. So um, the first function is to find a maximum number, the, the biggest number from a vector of strings, and the strings hold the numbers. As I said, this is a simplified version of something that is in our code. Um, the, um, of course, the code doesn't look like this, but you know that's just the, the simplified version um, that I extracted out of our code so that I can show you um, how you could use ranges in that case. So um, as I said, we have a vector of strings. Um, there are numbers in that. And then um, we want to find out the biggest number. So we initialize the maximum with the um, numeric uh, limits for, for ints. And then we have a range based for loop. And then we call standard max and convert every number in the vector to string. And then just um, find out which one is bigger. And in the end, we return the maximum. And if we want to rangeify this, we have to first look at the loops and see if we spot an algorithm behind that. So um, in this case, it's not that hard. There is a ranges max algorithm in the ranges library. So you can use that one and you call it on the uh, input vector. 
And then um, I have a transform view here that transforms the numbers into strings. And uh, in this case, I need to use a lambda because string to int is an overload and it doesn't work if you just type in this function. So in this case, sadly, you need to provide a lambda to do this. Um, but what it does is transforming um, the number into, a, into an int and then calling um, maximum on that. Actually, it is performed lazily. So every time a value is from the input vector is evaluated, it will be um, uh, converted to an integer and then it will be passed into the function. When you see this little um, compiler explorer symbol here, then um, I have a link in there. So if you, when, if you get the slide deck, um, so you can get all the examples and play around with them um, as you please. So for the next step, I just highlighted which lines of the code correspond to each other. So the for loop is represented by the um, ranges max function. And um, again, the maximum search is covered by the ranges max. And string to int here is called inside of the lambda. Um, yeah, as I said, there's no other way of doing this with overloaded functions. So this is the end of the um, first example. So if you have any questions on that example or anything that I said before, um, please ask them now. So yeah, wonderful. There's a question from Klaus. Um, he's asking, do you know why the ranges algorithm is no longer called max element? Um, there is a max element, I think. Um, ranges max returns the maximum value, and um, um, maybe I'm uh, maybe I'm confusing those two. But there's one that returns um, an iterator, and um, that was the C++ 17 version um, that returns an iterator to the max number, and ranges max returns the actual value. Um, I think you can get the iterator in uh, ranges as well. I don't think it was it was the max method. It, it was called something different. Okay. So that's it. Uh, no, but yeah. Thanks. That uh, question is answered. Okay. 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 Then I'm moving on to the next example, which is sliding mean. So um, I found a version of sliding mean again in our code. <clears throat> this is, uh, I also need to say that our code base ranges from quite old to very new and we try to update um, as we go. So um, if someone would uh, change something um, in the file where the sliding mean is, they would um, modernize it um, <clears throat> as good as they can. So um, sometimes I find some, uh, there are some old examples um, in the code and sometimes there are like newer examples in the code. So this was, I think, a little bit older. We have a sliding mean here um, and we want to have the sliding mean over five elements. And so the output range is four elements shorter than the input range. This is what we're doing here. And then we iterate over um, the input range starting at two and um, stopping at range size minus two. I'm, I don't have any boundary checks in here um, just to don't clutter the code, but usually you would have uh, boundary checks. Um, and then we call a mean function, um, which just sums up all the values and um, divides it by five. And here into this mean function, um, we we create an, an um, standard array with all the five values that we want to have the sliding mean over, and then we store it in the output vector. And in the end, we return the vector. So when we want to rentify this, again, um, I would first look at the loop and see what the loop is doing. And in this case, you might think that you need an index loop. Um, or that you need to drop like the first or the last elements. But that's actually not necessary. Um, you can use the sliding view from range v3. 
here the sliding window is five. If uh, you have less than five elements, it just takes the number of elements that you have, which is very handy. And then you can call transform on the, uh, on the sliding window. So what this pipeline does is it takes the range, it takes five elements from the range, and then it calls the mean function on these five elements. And then um, I, again, call ranges two to create a vector. This is um, something that I just do in this code, I think out of consistency or because I just like to create new vectors, but it's um, strictly saying it's not necessary. You could return a view here and then use the view in your calling code, depending on what you want to do. Like if you just want to loop over it, then you can just uh, return the view and then loop over the view. And then you don't have to create a new vector. Um, yeah, this is, again, it's a little bit up to you and up to your code, how you want to handle the results of these, uh, uh, of these ranges of these pipelines. But with the um, example above, there was no other way of um, doing this. Um, you needed to create a new range. And um, with the ranges version, there's no actual need depending on what you want to do next. Um, a side note for the mean function. Um, this mean function takes a span, um, just like the input range here, that's also a span. And the, um, the sliding window view can be converted. This, this is a sub range and it can be converted into a, a span. So this is why I can call the same mean function on a standard vector. I could call it on a an, on an array, um, on a C-style array, uh, on, and also here on on sub ranges, which I think is like is really cool. So you don't have to change your mean function if it already um, accepts spans as input. And. Uh, Another note, like now, if you read this code in the future, you need to change this code and you want to change the sliding window, maybe from five to seven or even more or less, then you could just change the number in the sliding view. Um, with the example above, you need to change like the entire code. So this is very handy um, to have its sliding window view. And the corresponding code lines here, um, again, the loop and also create the creation of the array with the five elements. This is done by the sliding view. And then the mean function is called in the transform view. And we create a new vector just like we did um, with the uh, original function. But as I said, depending on what you want to do with the output, there's no actual need to do that to allocate more memory. So this is the end of the second example. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. So yeah, there's a question. It's, is the complexity of ranges of the ranges solution equivalent to the loop solution? What do you mean by complexity? I'm not sure what the author means. Um, Pick one definition of complexity. <laughs> so um, I looked at uh, a little bit at the um, at the performance, for example, and um, I didn't find like um, any changes to the compile time. Also, the runtime is extremely similar. Um, depending on what you're doing, sometimes it's a little bit faster, sometimes it's a little bit slower, but it's all. Um, you know, it, it's very close together. I use QuickBench um, to benchmark my, my ranges code and my non-ranges code. And it was all extremely close together. And also compile time, but with the small examples like this, compile time is short already. Um, if you use it on a large scale code base, not quite sure we are using them uh, in our company, um, but not in a way that we, found any meaningful like numbers that we slowed down or speeded up our um, compilation time. And also the same with the runtime. 
Okay, wonderful. Thank you for the answer. And maybe if you think about complexity in terms of uh, cognitive complexity or overhead in order to understand it. Um, I think there is, um, it, it depends on, on how you look at it. So um, if you're used to, as I said in the beginning, if you're used to a lot of index loops, then looking at the first loop might be easier for you to read and understand. But you see how it is implemented. You don't really see the meaning behind it besides the name of the function. Like if, if I would <clears throat> have called it something different, which is like maybe not very uh, clear, then I think you would have a harder time reading what's actually going on. And with all the indices and subtracting one and two and adding them, it's always harder, I think, to read. And with the second version here, um, you have a cognitive overload. Um, more, you, you need to think a little bit more about this if you're not used to ranges because you need to know what sliding does and you need to know what transform does. But I think once you've learned your algorithms, it's not that hard to read. And I think in most cases, it's actually easier to read. Mm -hmm. Like if I would pick something, uh, like if I would pick a solution like this example here from the sliding mean, I think the second one is way clearer what's happening than the first one. Mm -hmm. Okay, just uh, to, to understand correctly, they're not strictly the same, right? The first one would be undefined behavior, if you call it with something in less than five elements, and the next yeah. one, be, you get a different result because it, the last window or the first window and the last window would be a smaller size, right? Yeah, as I, as I said, there are no boundary checkings in here. Like usually we wouldn't have like this code just, you know, taking a range size minus four and then be happy with that. So usually there would be boundary checks and we would also have then the same boundary checks in um, the rangeified version of the function so that we can actually make sure that we have the same result in the end or the, the intended result. There are two more questions if you have time for them. Hmm? Wonderful. Um, the one was kind of answered already, I think. The person is asking about uh, bottom line performance and not just big O. And I guess you answered this already, right? You said you have done some ex you have experience with it and you haven't seen a noticeable degradation, right? Yes. Wonderful. And then there's another question from Hans and he asks, um, how do you debug an operation like this? Uh, for example, if the transform function doesn't w w do what you think it does or what you want it to do. Um, yeah, debugging is um, maybe a little bit more complicated, but um, well, this is quite easy case. This transform function um, <clears throat> calls another function, which is called mean. So you can debug into the mean function. So if you think transform isn't doing what you want it to do, you can debug into the mean function. You see the input to the mean function, and then you see the five elements and you see what's going on. That's usually the case with the transforms. If you have a lambda, you can also debug into the lambda. Um, that's usually not, I think, a problem. Um, when you want to see um, maybe what sliding does, then you, at least I think um, what I would do is um, to divide the code in, for debugging um, reasons in two steps like first getting the sliding window, maybe creating a new vector so that I can look at the elements of the vector if I'm not sure what sliding does, and then mm -hmm. calling transform on the new vector. And then just to see what um, transform does to the, the, yeah, to the elements that I got out of sliding. Um, this is like, this is debugging code, yeah. The person but, says that answers the question, so thank you. But if, if you, um, like in most of my examples, I create new vectors and then you can look into the vector and see the elements. If you don't have that, then again, for debug reasons, I would just simply create a new vector, look at the output, see if it does what I wanted to do. And then maybe if I, if I don't need the vector, then discard the code. Okay. Any more questions? Um, no, I think that's it. So um, the next example is called subtract mean. <clears throat> and this is something or something similar um, that we do in my company a lot. So we work with big matrices 
And these can be um, 1D, 2D, or 3D. And the 2D matrices, or also 3D matrices, they have axes to them. So we have a distance in one axis and um, an angle in the other axis. <clears throat> so this is a common setup for um, our pipeline inspection tools. And this is a common setup for our data then as well. And um, so in this case, um, we're using Boost Multi-Array here because we're using them in my company as well. We have a matrix. And then for each column of the matrix, there was a mean calculated already. So we get a vector of column means <clears throat> and a corresponding matrix. And we want to subtract um, the column mean from every column of uh, the matrix of the, the corresponding value. Um, maybe to normalize it. Um, to do that, we have a for loop over all the rows in the matrix. And then we have an index based loop um, over the size of the column mean. Again, I would have some kind of boundary checking here to see that the um, column mean, <clears throat> the size is the same as the number of columns in my matrix. I don't have this here just to simplify things. Um, and then I subtract the column mean from the row element. And then I, <clears throat> I guess I normalized my matrix. And um, so there is a way to rangeify this. And uh, I also use this quite a lot <clears throat> but, um, when the data aligns like this. <clears throat> so again, I'm going to look at the loop here and see what I actually want to do. And um, what I'm doing here is I'm repeating, um, this is the second loop, I'm repeating um, the column mean vector like over and over again. And there is a uh, range adapter for this if you want to repeat a range over and over again. And um, <clears throat> in this case, I can um, iterate over my matrix flat. So this is a 2D matrix. Um, it's all stored um, in, um, continuously in the uh, 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 in, in memory. <laughs> And um, I can flatten the matrix as is, and then I become, uh, then, then I get out um, like column after column after column. So for, for each row, I get all the, the column values. Hope it makes sense. So if you want to have a flat representation from a um, boost multi array, you can make a span out of it. A span is a non owning container, so it's like a view, um, a view to your data. And <clears throat> matrix uh, uh, multi-array has this origin function, which is the pointer to the first underlying element. This is the equivalent of dot data if you um, use a standard container. If you use dot data on the standard container, you get the pointer <clears throat> to the underlying data, and the same here is done with origin. And you need to tell Sven how much elements you want to have. And the multi-array knows this, so um, it's the number of elements. If this wouldn't be multi-array, if this wouldn't be like um, another 2D container that is maybe a little bit more um, standard alike, I would use um, the join view. And the join view would also make the 2D matrix 1D. Um, but it doesn't work with multi-array. I don't know if it works now, but as, when I tested it, it didn't work. Um, <clears throat> and then, so this is the first argument for the transform view. So this is what I glossed over. So the first argument for the transform view is our first range. And the first range is the entire matrix, but in a flat representation. And uh, ranges transform like uh, standard, tra like the C++ 17 version of the standard transform takes two input ranges. So the second input range that we have is the column mean. And the column mean here, I need to repeat over and over again. And if I want to do that, I can use the cycle view. And this does what I just said. If, if it um, reaches the end of the column mean vector, <clears throat> it cycles back to the beginning and starts over again. So this would be the equivalent to the second loop. 
And then um, transform needs to know where I want to store my output in. And in this case, I want to store it back into matrix. And then I, again, I can call matrix origin to get the underlying data um, of the matrix. And then I need to provide a function. And in this case, um, it's a lambda that has the matrix element as first element and the mean as second element. And then we do the subtraction um, in, the, uh, in the body of the lambda. So what is corresponding here is like this nested loop is all done with the radius transform and flattening the matrix. Um, <clears throat> to get the column mean again and again um, for the right value, I can call cycle. And the um, subtraction is actually done in the lambda instead of the um, in exact instead of the um, nested for loop. Yeah, this is it for the second example. So if you have any questions on that, please. There are, as far as I can see, no further questions. Okay. Next, I have an example um, that also comes up, I think, um, it comes up a lot in our code um, because the um, sensor data that we get, they can be defective. Um, the data model doesn't look like this. Um, it's, again, a simplified version of what we have. But um, you can think of it as um, a value, and um, the value can be defective or non-defective. So in this case, I just have a uh, vector of data and the data holds a value and a bool if it's defective or not. <clears throat> and it, from this range, I want to sum up all the values that are non-defective. So first I need to um, declare um, the sum. Uh, again, I, I've stored integers here, so this is uh, zero. Then I have a index based for loop, could have been, uh, yeah, could have been a range based for loop. Um, it doesn't matter in this case. <clears throat> and um, then in the, in the body of the for loop, I ask if the value is defective or not, and I only add it to the sum if it's non-defective. And then in the end, I return the sum. So if we want to rangeify this, um, <clears throat> we also, we again, look at the loops. Uh, and if we want to sum up something um, from a range, then usually we would use accumulate. And so we would do in this case as well. <clears throat> but accumulate in this case would accumulate all the values um, if it's something that um, overloaded the uh, or that supports the, the plus operator. But in this case, we want to filter the range on all the non defective values. And filter again is already the keyword. There is a view called filter. And with filter, you can filter your data. Um, the filter view needs to return a bool, and um, with this boolean, the range is filtered. <laughs> Not surprising. Um, the arguments here for the uh, for the filter method is um, first a, a standard function which is called not fn. I'm going into detail in that um, shortly. But the um, second um, argument is a so-called projection. And this projection extracts, I would say, um, the data member <clears throat> um, from, an, uh, from some class type. So this works with structs and this works with uh, classes. And um, so it's, it's like a pointer to the member. So in, in this case, um, I'm going to extract from my, uh, from my input range um, only the Boolean is defective. 
Um, but I want to sum up all the non-defective values. If I would just write filter uh, data is defective, I would get all the defective values because is defective is true when the value is defective. And to revert that, I can, or to uh, revert, I don't know, um, to change that around, um, I can use the not fn function, um, which just negates um, everything that it gets if it's a Boolean. So if it gets a true, it will be a false. If it will be false, it gets true. So in this case, if the um, data returns is defective um, equals false, then it will um, negate it to true. And because this is the value that we want to use to, uh, to accumulate. Oh, this is clear. Um, so now we filtered out all the non-defective values. So the range only, you can see it as the range only contain, now contains non-defective values. And then we need to um, tell the accumulate function again what we, um, that we want to accumulate on the actual values and not on the Booleans. Um, and this I do again with a projection. And now I am like extracting, I don't know how to better say that, um, the value out of the struct. Um, so that this is what the data members are called. The members are called um, is defective and the other member is called value. And now I have filtered on all the non-defective values and the accumulate function only gets the value. So it only gets the integers that are stored and not, um, uh, yeah, and not the other part of the data member. And the last uh, input that accumulate needs is the start value to sum things up and this is zero. So this is what the um, accumulate look like. Um, this is exactly the same as the function above. Again, I highlighted here um, what code examples correspond to each other. The summing up is done by the accumulate function. Checking if the value is non-defective is done with its filtering um, by extracting the data member is defective and then negating it and then filter the range uh, on that um, return type or return value. And then we get the value out of the range to uh, accumulate that and the start value for the sum is zero in both cases. This is one way of doing this. Um, with accumulate, you can do a second way as well. <clears throat> so the beginning is the same. The first, um, uh, the first uh, argument is uh, the range that is filtered on all the non-defective values. And now we use all the parameters that you can give to the accumulate function. So um, the next argument is um, again, the start value on which we want to accumulate, which is zero. And then we say um, that we want to add all the values. So this is standard plus. And then we um, can tell the accumulate function that we want to extract the value, that it should um, sum up all the values um, out of the struct. And this is done by a projection. So um, the C++ uh, 20 algorithms and also range v3, which I'm using here, um, they all support this projection um, syntax. And if you look at them side by side, I think it's, um, I don't know, yeah, I don't know how to how to say it. It's a little bit um, based on on your style, um, how you would want to write this. I would be okay with either either of those um, if I would get them in code review. I think both are readable, but in this case, um, again, again. So um, the question was with the cognitive overload. Um, you need to know what not fn does, and you need to know what a projection is. So what this. Um, um, pointer to member syntax does in this case. And also <clears throat> you need to know um, how accumulate works. So what inputs accumulate gets. So it can get a range 
and a uh, start to sum the values up. Um, and then it will sum up automatically. So you don't have to um, specify which function you want to use. And in, in the second um, solution here, you give the, um, uh, the exact summing up uh, the, the, the function that you want to use. Uh, in this case, it would be plus. Um, but you could use another function here. You could use multiplies or a minus or something like that. So accumulate. Um, it has the flexibility to do that, but um, the name uh, is, uh, is a little bit misleading if you use something different than plus. So I think this is why I think C++ 23 will have a fold for this. And fold then um, is a little bit clearer when you use different functions, what it's actually doing. Any questions on that one? I have a possible question. Um, this data is the factor and data value. Are these functions you have to implement yourself or is it something that automatically somehow works of any type? Um, this uh, projection, this works automatically. So I have a struct defined here. Back to the slides. I have the struct here with these um, members. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it works automatically. So this is like pointed to um, member syntax and it just, it just does, it just works. You don't have to implement anything special for that. Okay, thank you. And all of the C++ um, 20 functions support that as far as I know. All the range-based versions. I'm not sure about the non-range-based versions. And range retrieve um, supports that as well. So accumulate here is not um, part in the uh, part of the standard library, um, the range-based version. So this here is range retrieve. At least the accumulate part. Any more questions? There are no further questions. Yes. Okay. Then I'm jumping to the next example, and this is called length calculation. So um, I have three vectors, x, y, and z, and I want to calculate the length um, from the origin of the coordinate system. And to do that, um, <clears throat> I store the length in a new vector again, because I like my new vectors. Um, I have a, an index-based for loop. Um, again, no boundary checkings here. I just pretend that I know that X, Y, and Z are the same size. And then I um, calculate the length by multiplying um, X by X and Y by Y, Z by Z. Uh, adding them to each other and then um, <clears throat> and then calculating the square root and this is then the length of this vector. Um, this is pretty straightforward but there is um, a rangeified version for this and there's also um, a little bit uh, there's also a math function that we can use. So again a new vector um, I like them. So <clears throat> now, when you want to combine um, different ranges into one for loop, and you know they're the same size, you know maybe from other languages like Python um, that you can use something like zip. And um, range v3 also has a zip function. It looks like this. So this is now a range-based for loop. Um, where I zip together um, x, y, and z, and also the output vector length. And um, what you get back from the ranges view zip is a tuple. And when I have uh, tuples or pairs, sometimes structs or arrays, I tend to <clears throat> like to deconstruct them right away. So this is what I'm uh, doing here. So I'm using so I'm deconstructing the tuple into um, the different uh, 
variables and then I can do the calculation. And actually for this calculation of the length, there is a function in CMath that is called HyPod. I hope I pronounce it correctly. And it does the exact same calculation as the one that you see in the loop above. Uh, it also has an overload for two elements and it has this overload for three elements. So I think this is really handy. And so with this solution, you can um, have one for loop. Uh, you can have a range-based for loop. So this is the advantage. So you can have a range-based for loop and you don't have to fiddle around with indices and to, to calculate, um, uh, to get out the values out of your uh, ranges. <clears throat> but there's also another way of doing this, a uh, little bit more ranges way, a little bit more than this. <clears throat> you could um, again use range B3 zip. And now you only zip together um, X, Y, and Z. And then you can call transform on the zipped range. And again, um, coordinates here would be a tuple, but in this case of three elements. So the elements of X, Y, and Z, and not four elements because we're not zipping like any output vector into it. Again, I'm deconstructing my tuples here. I think it's easier to read than to use the get syntax. I, I don't like it, I think it's messy. And then I call um, HyPod again. Really hope I pronounced this correctly. Um, to calculate the length, I return it here inside of the lambda. And then because I want to have my vector, I don't need to, in this case again, I could return the, uh, the view, but I want to have my vector, so I'm calling ranges two again and um, converting it into a vector. By the way, you don't need to use um, uh, ranges to vector um, all the time like I'm doing. If you have something that returns a, um, a pair, for example, <clears throat> you could use ranges to and then uh, make a map out of it, for example. So a lot of other containers work with ranges to as well. I just like vectors. But um, map is totally possible as well, but then your function needs to return a pair that it can actually create a map out of. And here are the two examples again, side by side. So the first one is a range with for loop um, where we zip together the output range as well. And the second one is um, the range based, more range, more range based version where we only zip together the input ranges and we um, could create an output range, but um, the function could also return um, the view in this case. Again, depending on what you want to do with the result. Yeah, are there any questions on this one? I'm not seeing any further questions. <clears throat> okay. So if you have a question later on, um, you can ask this later as well. So this is um, the next example. It's um, the next to last, I think. Um, and uh, we want to do some sorting. Again, I have a struct here. Um, the struct holds a name, which is a string, and a score, which again is an integer. <clears throat> and uh, you already know my style. I have a function that gets a vector of um, this name and score. And um, we want to sort the range by score. We could sort it by name, but we want to sort it by score. Um, to do that, we can use, um, this is the C++17 version, we can use standard sort, uh, call begin and end on the range. And then we need to um, define a lambda that is telling the sorting function what it should sort. And in this case, we want to sort by score and we want to score uh, sort in um, descending order. So we want to have the highest score first. And this is what it would look like. Um, compare um, right-hand side to left-hand side and um, return uh, the bigger one. 
And if we want to rangeify this, we can use standard range of sort. Now we don't have to call begin and end on the uh, on the range. And then we tell the sorting function what we want to sort it like. So in this case, I want to sort it in descending order. So this would be the greater function. If I want to sort it in ascending order, it would be less. So um, here it's it's greater. And then I can use the, um, the protection syntax again, which I think is really handy. So now I can just type um, name and score score and now the sorting function only sorts on the score and i don't have to overload like uh, a uh, comparing uh, or comparing operators for for the struct or, or something like that um, it just like works out of the box just like you see it here and what i like about this example is um, i don't know if you're like me but if you're like me if you look at the first version and you see the comparing lambda, I don't exactly know what's going on. I, I, I really need to think about it to know that is sorted in descending order. Um, and I get this wrong a lot. Like the, the order um, for the sorting, I get it wrong a lot. So for me, it's way simpler to use greater then I can actually read what's going on and I cannot make a mistake by, by um, making uh, typing less instead of greater. Um, and also here um, extracting the score, I think is very clear that you want to sort the range on the score and you want to sort it in decent order. So this is what I really like about the C++ 20 version. I think, I personally think it's way more readable. Um, but I want to show you a second syntax for this, which is not in the standard, but it is in range v3. And this is called actions. So what we saw before were views and um, views don't change the underlying range, but actions do <clears throat> like sort. Sort is an action and sort changes the actual underlying vector or range. <clears throat> so the syntax is pipe equals and then ranges action sort. And I think this looks actually really, really nice. And now you have the same inputs as you had for the standard version. You call greater um, and you give it the protection. So you give it the uh, member that you want to sort the range on. Yeah, so this is the um, range v3 version of sorting the range. I think that looks really, really cool. But I also think that the C++ 20 version, like there's nothing wrong with it. Do you have any questions on that one? Oh, yeah. A question just was asked by Hans. And he asks, does the projection syntax only work with pointer to data member? Or does it also work with pointer to member functions? Uh, I don't know, to be honest. I only um, use it like this with data members. I never tried it with member functions. Also, would it call the member function or would it, like, how would it work? Would it evaluate during the proje projection? Um, I actually don't maybe know. Maybe that's a, yeah. something we can talk about in the after talk chat, right? Yeah, yeah. We can, we can test this as well then with Compile Explorer or something. Okay, I think um, I'm seeing no further questions. Okay, um, then I'm going to the last <clears throat> example that I have provided. And this is called index handling. <clears throat> and <clears throat> I'm sorry, I need to warn you, this looks like a mess <clears throat> because it is a mess. <clears throat> uh, when I looked around uh, in our code, um, for examples that I can use here, I also looked for like something that might be a little bit more challenging um, to convert into ranges. And I found <clears throat> something that looks like this. Again, this is a simplified version. We have something completely different in, in our code, but this is a simplified version of this. 
and I called it index handling, and it gets a vector of vector of size t. And this is called index. And also the inner vector also holds indices. So this is it's going to be wild. Um, we, like always, have our output vector. No surprise there. Then we loop over the index vector. And then we loop over the inner index vector because it holds an index as well. It's not um, confusing at all. And then we ask if the inner index is equals the outer index, or <clears throat> uh, is not equal. And if it's not equal, then we push back the inner index into the outer vector. I cannot tell you what this is used for. I <laughs> have no idea. It's some kind of <clears throat> advanced, uh, I think, uh, functions maybe in, in feature search. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, this is also not the, the newest code. So forgive us uh, for having something similar like this. <clears throat> but I thought this might be a good challenge to um, try to, to rangeify this. And uh, I actually had some fun um, playing around with that. And this is what I came up with. So first, when I look at the loop, um, I see that I need the index from the uh, from the index vector, so from the input vector, because I need to compare the index from the outer vector to the index from the inner vectors. And uh, if I want to get <clears throat> an index to the values, I can use enumerate. This is something that, again, if you use um, like Python <clears throat> or similar languages, then um, you know already the enumerate function. This works the same um, in ranges. Again, this year's range U3 enumerate is, I don't think, part of the C20 um, standard. <clears throat> now that I have, um, so this is the, the outer loop. And now that I have the <clears throat> inner vector and an index to that, I can call transform on that. And uh, what I get now is a tuple of um, index and inner range. So I'm deconstructing my tuple. Now I have the, uh, I, I try to have the, the same names in the index, in the, in the ranges example as in the um, for loop example. <clears throat> so I is now the index of the outer loop and index range is the um, inner range. So it's, again, it's a vector of vectors. So this is the inner range. And now we want to filter the inner range um, on the indices. So um, <clears throat> I call ranges view filter, and I have a lambda in there that compares the outer index, which is i, to the inner index, which is um, the value that you get when you iterate over the inner range. But now what we have created in, at this stage is a range of subranges. So for every um, vector in your um, input range, you will have a subvector of these filtered elements. But this is not what you want to have. You want to have it all in one big range. <clears throat> so we make this 2D range, we make it 1D by using join. So now this vector of sub, uh, this range of subranges will become one big range. And then again, my uh, range is two vector. As you might see, this looks a little bit messy, not that readable. And I don't know, I, I had fun writing it, but I don't think I would have fun reading it. <clears throat> Could we make it more readable? Um, <clears throat> by extracting maybe the transform function, <clears throat> sorry, the transform lambda, giving it a name or something. Yeah, sure, <clears throat> we could, but it is, there are cases. <clears throat> where I actually recommend to maybe not use ranges like <clears throat> the. <clears throat> oh, sorry, <laughs> too much talking. Um, <clears throat> the, the first function, there's like no real algorithm behind that. So if you look at all the other examples here, there was a accumulate, there was a ranges max, um, 
there was transform, there was filter. So there are actual algorithms behind that that you could use. But in this case, there's no algorithm behind that that um, represents what is going on in the loop. And if a loop like this exists and it's, um, yeah, it, it's no standard algorithm and it's something that, I don't know, needed to happen in order for the code to work, then I think in this case, it might be better to just leave the code as is. Um, I think in, in, in this case, especially the first one is more readable. The, the loop one is more readable than the ranges one. Again, we could attempt to make the ranges one more readable, but I mean, what's, what's the point? So yeah, again, for some examples, I think um, it's better to not actually rangeify them. Yeah, if you do you have any questions on this beauty? Maybe let's give people a small moment to ask, but I'm not seeing any questions so far. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I don't think okay. there are further questions right now. <clears throat> okay, then I'm going to move on. We have time for more questions later anyways. <clears throat> so I'm almost done with the talk anyways. Um, a quick note on performance. I already said that in the beginning and answering the question. I have a bigger example um, that is written in a C++ 17 style and I rangeified it. And I saw no significant difference in uh, runtime and also in Compile, compile time I didn't measure because it was <clears throat> fast to begin with and uh, it, it was fast with ranges as well. And um, runtime I checked with um, be uh, Google Benchmark or QuickBench. And um, yeah, it, in essence, it was the same. So um, I'm planning to go a little bit further into the performance um, of ranges to like really. Um, maybe use a lot of different tools um, for that. Um, maybe find out, um, get more get more numbers on compile time and runtime and um, like analyzing um, the ranges version of the code. <clears throat> but this is what I planned in the future. It's, uh, yeah, not done yet. And um, just a quick summary, um, there are lots of great talks about ranges if you want to get started with them and also lots of libraries that you can use apart from the standard library. Um, the standard library lacks some features. So if you want to learn how to write your own range adapters, um, you can look up the talks for that. And again, um, the key of writing code like this and also reading code like this and understanding it is to learn what is available. Um, this is maybe an uh, advantage that the standard library does not have a lot of um, ranges right now. So you can just, you know, learn as, as you go. Uh, if you look at range three, three, this is a huge library. So if you want to learn everything that is in that library, this will take you a while. Um, but for the standard library, it's not that much. Um, if you want to start somewhere, I think you should start with the standard library. And then if you're really missing some functionality, you can branch out and see if um, the functionality is uh, used or is already implemented somewhere else, like in range v 3 And uh, yeah, once you get used to writing the code in ranges and thinking a little bit more in ranges, it will actually get easier to think also ranges first and not just um, write the loop and then go back to the loop and think how you can rangeify it. So the more you practice it, the more you think in ranges first, and then you can uh, uh, yeah, directly write the code in, in ranges. Yeah, and uh, if you have um, reason to think that um, your ranges version might be, um, <clears throat> uh, might be slower than your non-ranges version, then yeah, you should benchmark it. Um, like with every code, don't uh, 
don't optimize until you know that there's something to optimize. And usually it's very fast and yeah, usually it's also fast enough. So um, this was it for the talk. Thank you so much for the attention. Um, if you have any more questions, feel free to ask. So there is a general question asked by Yo CPP, and they ask, um, did you observe any difference in testability of your code compared to more classic uh, C style? Um, no, not really. Um, as I said, we, uh, in, at least in our code, um, <clears throat> I guess this, uh, I guess this uh, already you see in the style of the examples that I wrote, um, we usually create new um, ranges, like new vectors or new multi-arrays um, for the output. And then you can test them the exact same way as you would um, like any other loop where you needed to create a new output. Um, but if you have a function that returns a view, then you can, um, we wrote a Google test matcher for views um, that works with that. Or you could in your test um, get the view and then transform the view into a vector and then test the vector. So I don't think there's um, problems in testability there. Okay, thank you. And there's another, another question by Hans Jörg. And um, he asks, would it be possible to write our own view algorithm to simplify the index handling example in slide 26? Because if I remember earlier, we said um, that it doesn't map onto one of the existing algorithms. Mm -hmm. So maybe I think what they're implying is maybe it just needs a new algorithm to <laughs> model the problem essentially. Yeah, could be done. Um, yeah, would be entirely possible to write your own like little algorithm or range adapter for this. Um, but I think it only makes sense if you would use it like in uh, several um, uh, places in your code, if you only use it once, like in this very special case here, I don't think it's worth the time to actually write it. I mean, okay. you, you can do if it's, uh, if, if you like the challenge, <laughs> Um, but usually we don't generalize, generalize stuff unless we use it at least twice. Okay, I see. And I think that's it for questions right now. Um, so we have we will post a link in the chat for the after talk chat. Um, it's a Zoom meeting. You just need a Zoom client and to log in, and. Um, there you can ask questions to Tina directly, and we'll see you there. With that, many thanks to you, Tina, for this wonderful talk, and to everyone else, a good evening, or see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.